G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy Podcast. Today we've got a very special episode where I'm joined by Caden McDonald, the illustrious YouTuber with over 60,000 subscribers. This is Caden's second time on the podcast. Of course, he joined us for True Footy Podcast 50 some year and three months ago, but so much has happened since both in a global context and in terms of football as well. Today, Caden sits down to discuss with me how everything's going on YouTube his beloved D's, and what might be next on the cards for Caden in the future. But before we get into what I think is a really good yarn, we do have to bring you a message from our sponsors. Now, it's been a big winter here in Australia. You've got, obviously, the AFL season, you have the European Soccer Championships, and you've also got the Tokyo Olympics right now. Major sporting events are totally in this winter, but you know what's not totally in this winter? A wild and hairy bush. And no, I'm not talking about my co-host. Tame your pubes with the help from our sponsors, Manscaped, the leaders in below the waist grooming. If an athlete treats their body like royalty, why not treat your pubes like Olympic gold? The world is starting to open and the brand new performance package 4.0 from Manscaped is here to help you get ready. Inside you'll find the brand new Lawnmower 4.0, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Plus, if you get the performance package 4.0, you're treated to two free gifts, the Manscaped boxes and a shed travel bag. Talk about a world-class dismount into a post-quarantine world. This package is the perfect package for your package and peak performance in whatever sport you desire. The brand new Lawnmower 4.0 is here to take the podium. It's a fourth generation trimmer and it features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce nasty nut accidents. It has a 7000 RPM motor, a new multi-function on and off switch which can engage a travel lock and unlike the 3.0 model this allows you to turn off their LED spotlight. Did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too. Michael Phelps will be licking his lips. <laughs> like I said, the package comes with the weed whacker to chop your worst weeds up top in both your nose and your ear. This tool is a lock to take home the gold. Like the lawnmower, it is also waterproof. It uses a 9,000 RPM motion powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system. And just like the trimmer as well, it comes with an advanced skin safe technology. Show them some sportsmanship with Manscaped's liquid formulations. So what are you waiting for guys? Head to manscaped.com, get the brand new products with a 20% discount and free shipping if you use our discount code. That code is TRUE4020, all caps, all one word. Like I said, you get free shipping, which is handy in itself and 20% off. Added to that value is if you get the performance package 4.0, you get those free goodies I mentioned, such as the travel bag and the boxes. Make sure you achieve pubic glory this year with Manscaped. Thanks guys. Let's get into the podcast. All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to another very special True Footy Podcast 79, I believe. Uh, this time joined well, for the second time on the channel, Caden McDonald. Caden, how you doing, mate? Jesse, I am flying. It's uh, it's a great time to be alive this time of the year when footy gets a little bit more exciting, finals come around, and it's a little bit blue skies here where I'm living. So, I don't know, the vibes are good, the vibes are up, and I'm stoked to be on the pod again. Oh, that's good to hear, mate. Blue skies is nice. We've, uh, I think we've been raining for about 18 days straight, almost literally here in, uh, in Perth, um, which is, you know, strange. But uh, yeah, no, it's good to have you back on the pod, mate. And I guess the first question I want to ask is, when do you think we should start serious conversations about overthrowing Drizzy on the Drew Footy Show? Look, I have been trying to sort of do... I was going to say Germans. I think it... Oh, wait, hang on. Uh, the the Romans. I was try, I'm trying to do the Romans where I come in real friendly with him, the Trojan horse tactic, and he thinks that I'm sort of taking over as a bit of a co-host. I make sure that the audience <laughs> accept me, and then that's when I do the coup, and it's me and you, and we just, yeah, we go from there. But um, no, I, I like that, uh, that, that show. I, I like the rapport that you and Druzy have, so I could never match it, but I'm happy to come and give you blokes a chop out whenever you need. You're a humble man. No, I think you've been killing it. And I think uh, the views suggest that as well. I think a few people want you to stay as well. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of do like that German approach you started to allude to there. <laughs> yeah, I think German could have been a little bit more, a little bit more aggressive sort of tactics aggressive. of uh, taking over. But uh, anyway, I'll leave the history to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's got it coming. Um, yeah, cool, man. So last time we did a podcast, you were 
uh, you were the guest on True Footy Podcast 50, and that yeah. was, I think, March 2020, right as the pandemic started. So a uh, lot's happened yes. since then, man. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I think you were on 42,000 subscribers. I was on about 6,000. Yep. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty around um, whether the football season was going to go ahead. I think we just started that massive um, that postponement after round one. Yep. Um, I think I was in two weeks isolation because I just got back from Vietnam as well. So it's uh-huh, crazy yeah. how much has changed. <laughs> yeah. Um, round one had just come and gone and the Eagles uh, had just battered Melbourne. But it's crazy to think, you know, how much times have changed <laughs> since then. <laughs> uh, I guess the first question is, how, how are you traveling? Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm traveling okay, to be honest. I, we go in and out in lockdown uh, a little bit here in Victoria and... Uh, the first one, like last year, rocked me for six. Um, it, it was so lengthy, it was so long, it was so bleak. And I think if we go back and listen to the podcast, the excitement that I had for the year ahead talking to you was as massive as it could have been. I had worked my absolute ass off in 2019 to get into a position to uh take YouTube to the next level and take it more professionally and, and seriously and to have that all taken away as much as, you know, I acknowledge that a lot of people had it way tougher. Like I could still punch out videos at home. Um, so, as uh, uh, yeah, acknowledging that a lot of people had it tougher and everyone everyone went through a bit of a tough year in 2020, I was just flat as a tack. And, um, yeah, quest- questioned a lot, questioned whether I could come back, questioned if people would want the same sort of footy content two years later. It felt like a bit of a gap year and yeah, I was flat as a tack, but this year I wanted to sort of have my redemption year and um, I feel like I've been going okay. It's just, yeah, we've had the lockdowns again, so it's tough to try and stay positive, especially when um, you're forced to make sort of videos you don't really want to make and then they don't view as well and you're sort of losing sleep and working your ass off for a little reward. But um, I'm pretty sure, Victoria, we're starting to get a hang of it, and I'm hoping that we could end the footy season really, really strongly. But I'm going okay. How about you? How are you travelling? Yeah, yeah, not too bad, thanks, mate. We've um, we've kind of had a few lockdowns of our own. Um, thankfully, with Perth, we just kind of snap into lockdown at the slightest hint of COVID. Um, if we get, like one bloke who comes into the country uh, into the state rather and um you know is in the community we pretty much wait for the first case we lock down um and thankfully thankfully we've been lucky and i don't know if it uh, i mean i don't want to make this a covid podcast but i don't know how much of it is is perth people doing the right thing or, or if is it, it's yeah. just luck um but either way like uh in from a covid sense things are pretty decent here and that's made it a lot easier for me um i can't imagine what the poor buggers in sydney uh, and and you said you know Melbourne was like that last year, hmm. where the, there's no end in sight. That must be a real tough thing mentally when it's like okay, if I if I can stick it out for these next two months, everything will be back to normal. But obviously, you didn't really have that certainty in twenty nine uh, in twenty twenty, did you? No, no, there was no certainty at all. And uh, you know, halfway through when we really went hard on the lockdown to try and eradicate COVID in the community. There was so much sort of uh, opposition to it. There were so many people saying, "No, you just got to live with it. Like it's too far gone. You got to live with it." There was, um, you know, headline after headline saying, "We'll never get back down to zero cases. We'll never live normally." And yeah, I, I think media have a little bit of a part to play with it. Where like, oh, my anxiety was through the roof. Just every Twitter post I'd see from the Herald Sun and whatnot, any sort of article was just so dire. And um, I was really proud that the Victorian sort of stuck at it and got it done. And we lived like the best summer ever. It was freedom 2.0. I've been to that many footy games this year and I don't think it's possible if we didn't do what we did last year. And now I think we've got a bit of a WA approach to it where where it doesn't take us long at all. If there's a couple of cases pop up, we go you know, into our bunkers for a couple of weeks and we pop back up. And I think you see in Sydney, not that we're going to make this a COVID podcast, but you see if you can be a little bit hesitant, it can bite in the bum. So yeah, I wish everyone in Sydney all the best and hopefully we can unite as one Australia very soon. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Fingers crossed. I like just looking at the way your sort of your productivity is and, and your motivation, you, you seem like you're in a really good space. Do you think, um, do you think you're on 2019 levels in terms of, you know, your enthusiasm and your, your motivation and belief? Do you think that's come back? Because I know that dipped last year. Uh, yeah, that uh, evaporated last year. And I 
wasn't expecting it. I um in, in 2019, it, it's really weird because I've I've bounced around part time jobs and hated them and had no motivation and never wanted to do them and roll you know, going down to the golf course and having to wash dishes I was very reluctant and thinking of ways to get out of my shifts and um, even doing some street team work at Kiss FM in 2018 I had that same mindset so I was really questioning whether I had any work ethic in 2019 especially straight after school I'd see people go to full-time work and be a tradie and I'm going I could never do that does that mean I'm lazy and could never work so when I worked as much as I worked in 2019 with Cuco and the amount of videos we were producing on our own, but also the amount of stuff we were doing with the AFL. Um, it really made me feel like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I can do. You know, I'm working as much as the people that I used to envy um, straight after school would work. I'm working four or five, six days a week. Um, so in 2020, when that went away, the whole, like the whole footy industry moved out of Victoria. There was no real work here. A lot of people that I knew from the AFL got laid off. And then my channel itself, it, uh, the videos I was producing, I wasn't liking because they were stuck in the four walls of my house. Uh, there was no goal kicking challenges. There was no footy vlogs. So yeah, I did fall out of love with it. I fell into a real flat spot. And there was yeah times where I was really questioning whether I could do this as viable work or whether I could do this in terms of uh, will the audience come back. And um, yeah, so I have this real hunger to prove to myself that I can and well prove to other people even though I don't think there's many doubters but in my head there is there's a bit of a chip on my shoulder to come back this year and just pretty much prove to myself that I can do it and replicate what I've I did in 2019 and I yeah I do think what I'm producing is uh as good and I do think my love and my passion for it is through the roof so yeah absolutely loving it for sure that's good to hear, man. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear the, the things you're saying because, like, from an outside perspective, it makes sense. Like, okay, there's less footy on. Um, Caden doesn't have the same access to, to make the same videos or do the same work. But it's interesting here you talk about how much it seemed to be a blow on your self-esteem and how much you sort of believe that you could achieve things. And I think part of that might be because you've kind of, rather than coming from a, a background maybe of, like, working full-time and then transitioning to YouTube, maybe you, because you got a taste of what, like the life that you almost seem to to want to achieve mm. you you were starting to work with the afl everything was starting to like the domino affected and you were starting to achieve like some of your dreams almost i'd say <laughs> but like for for that for you to have a taste of that and then have that ripped away that must have been probably the worst element as opposed <laughs> to you know if 2019 had come after 2020 you wouldn't maybe have copped it so hard in 2020 100 percent, yeah i completely agree with you and it's because like the five or six year journey from finishing school for me was such a snakes and ladders type journey. Like the first year out of school, I was sitting on Centrelink volunteering at a radio uh, station in Geelong, just a community radio station. And, you know, I've got mates potting me for being on Centrelink. I've got mates potting me for not working. But in my head, you know, I'm putting six, seven hours into this radio station a couple of days a week. If that was a part-time job, I'd be earning normal sort of out of school money, like uni student sort of money. But um, because it was volunteering and I was just at a community radio station, I had to be on Centrelink. And um, I, I worked from that to doing some ground announcing stuff at Werribee, doing some more volunteering stuff at TSC Cup Radio um, to finally getting a, a sort of my first part-time job uh, washing dishes, but also on a street team in the radio station. So I, I wasn't really focused on uh sort of swaying from the goal of being like being in radio and even if there was like a cafe job i'd i'd be so patient that like no nah, i'll bum around for a little bit more because i will get the radio gig so i'd worked at that sort of grind for four or five years and to then transition from that focus to just focusing on my own content and doing it in youtube and to finally break through and get a little bit of success um, yeah, it was heartbreaking for it to get taken away, especially when, um, yeah, there was no assurance that it would come back. And I think what sort of worried me the most was my drop off in personal views, because I guess you can take away some of the gigs that Cook and I were doing with the AFL, which is the dream. And it's what I've been working for or working towards my entire life. You can take those gigs away, but, um, as long as I still got, you know, my YouTube channel firing, 
nothing really matters, but that wasn't. It, it was it had fallen off a cliff. The views had fallen off a cliff. Um, I had plans to upgrade equipment, upgrade, yeah, things around my house that I couldn't. And um, yeah, I don't think I've spoken publicly about this, but I definitely know I've told you before. But I I had gigs lined up that were dream come true. Like I had meetings at the Melbourne Footy Club about doing their podcasts and I went up to Richmond and had a coffee <laughs> with Clint Stanaway who was the host of the podcast and a couple of the, the media movers and shakers <laughs> at the uh, Melbourne media social team and whatnot and we pitched ideas and so I, I had stuff like that lined up where that's that's the dream. I've always wanted to be in radio. I love the D so to have essentially a one um, one show a week radio show talking about the D's is the dream come true. So I had a lot of those sort of gigs uh fall through my hands and yeah i was just spewing just all year i was bitter i was sad i was uh salty i was just absolutely spewing and i made sure that if i got a crack at doing this this year that i'd yeah leave no stone unturned to try and get back to the momentum i had a couple of years ago yeah that's it man i I do wonder if um do you think it probably in, in a way, like the way you're describing that, it sounds like, you know, it was obviously a real painful experience to have it sort of brought to you and then taken out of your hands before you could really grasp it. But do you think that there's probably another side to it where you kind of, you saw what was possible? And and that's something that um, maybe people such as myself who are trying to make a career of things were like, uh, I was just speaking for myself and people ask me, you know, what, what do you want to achieve? What, where is this going? And I, I still don't have a clear answer for that. And I, d- I don't know what the ideal situation looks like, but you actually got as close to just about being offered some of the things. And so you, you know that what you're capable of. So that, that must have really, did, well, did, did that burn a sort of a fire for you going into 2021 um, that, you know, that the things out there were possible? Uh, yeah, for sure. Like hundred percent. Like I had never really understood like i thought to be a youtuber you needed two million views and to be mates with ksi like i had no real grasp of what you could do with a small audience and once i sort of started to figure out that bands with five thousand followers on instagram make a living and you know they sell t-shirts they go to gigs um you know you don't need yeah like ind- independent bands with twenty thousand followers on their facebook make a living and so once I started to learn about that and how they went about, um, yeah, living off, uh, yeah, living off their art pretty much, um, it, it opened some doors to me. And I, I guess, um, yeah, w- once I sort of realised that, you know, um, Cameron Ling doesn't have one job during the year. He's on radio on a Monday, and then you know, Channel Seven on a Wednesday night, and then um, goes to footy clubs on a Thursday, and then calls footy on three different stations over the weekend started to twig um, to me that, you know, maybe I do a bit of YouTube and maybe I do um, a little bit of merch and then maybe I do have a weekly radio segment and then uh, uh, maybe I do have an AFL uh, gig with the AFL. So I started to really realize that, you know, you got to do multiple things to earn a bit of a living. So yeah, it did open that door and it, it did make me realize, yeah, what it takes and yeah when it did sort of uh, plateau for the year there was a lot of doubts that crept in like I started thinking towards the end of the year I, I was putting out a FIFA career and I realized that my audience love all the videos with my friends in them and they love some of the AFL Evolution gaming so I thought pro clubs FIFA career uh, that's just a recipe for you know success and I was getting 400 views a week <laughs> on some of the videos and I just thought geez does it go up from here like what if it doesn't um it's just not sustainable so yeah all those doubts crept in but it did make me hungry and fired up and yeah really determined to bounce back this year that's good mate yeah i think uh dylan buckley is a good example of that play of that person you sort of describe where if you just look at his youtube channel in terms of like, you know views and stuff like that, it's hard to imagine he's ex- <laughs> successful as he is. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I don't, don't want that to sound disparaging, but it's like it's not a massive YouTube channel, but like he's got 
such a diversified pol- uh, portfolio. He's, he's clearly got like commitments all around the shop. Uh, he's done media gigs um, and he must sell a shit ton of merch. It's it's quite an interesting model where you don't really need a massive audience to, to monetize it, if that makes sense. And that's probably something I'm still trying to work out <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of trying to make this a career. But do you, what, what did it mean to you to hit 60K subs last year, this year rather? Because I, I remember... I watched the uh, the video you did with Druzy, the Druzy on, um, yep. as a bit of research, and you were saying that 50k didn't really feel like a lot to you. You were, I think, you were on about 48 at the time of recording it, and I, I, I take it that's because you were on the brink of 50 for so long. Yeah. But but when I was on the live stream with you when you uh, when you hit 60 and you seemed up and about, so what did that mean to you? Uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit odd. I thought I would fly through. I thought, yeah, like after 2019, I think I had 20,000 views, uh, 20,000 subscribers in about six or seven months. It just shot up and I thought 50 would just be a walk in the park, 60 would come and go. I'd be at, you know, 70 or 80 by the end of 2020 and then I'd hit the 100 pretty soon after. So I wasn't really focusing on small milestones and i don't really like to celebrate them necessarily i think i got up at about for one and five ten twenty and then i made like a point like once i've hit 20 head down bum up nothing else means anything you know sort of grind but i think that's probably a a little bit of a detrimental approach to things it it's sort of I don't know. It's a determined approach and it's sort of like blinkers on, but I think you got to stop and smell the roses every now and again. And uh, yeah, it just didn't pan out that way. I sat on 40, in the 40,000s for 18 months, I think, after getting 20,000 subscribers in six or seven months. So yeah, you can never, <laughs> you can never uh, count the chickens before they hatch. And I, I just felt, yeah, stuck in the mud. Uh, and then I f- slowly crept closer to 50 and then I sort of hit 48 and I I don't know, I felt like I was on 50,000 for a couple months because it still took that time to cross over, cross over the threshold. And I, I also felt like not celebrating it because of how little I'd achieved in 18 months. I felt like, I don't know, I'd, I'd achieved nothing in 18 months. I'd be a little bit weird to get excited for sort of failing for 18 months so i just wanted to get over that hump and yeah since then i've hit another six you know another ten thousand subscribers in within a couple of months and I, I don't know i feel up and about i feel very thankful for where i'm at instead of trying to look too far forward i think uh, my mindset this year has just been about feeding into what i've got um like really appreciating the audience which i always have but um instead of you know sometimes i can sit there and go i want to make a video that uh, exceeds this audience and is bigger than this audience and then it, it flops and I go well that's really stupid maybe I should just make videos that pander to this audience um, I know what videos are like making I feel like I've got a good relationship and a good understanding of the audience that I have so I'm, I'm just going to start tapping into the audience and start bouncing off them and bouncing off that energy that I get from them and uh, so that's what I've tried to do this year and yeah I think just really appreciating what you've got and sort of working with what you've got is a better attitude than blinkers on uh, head down bum up and just sort of trying to yeah play out too far ahead yeah i can relate totally to what you said um similar to you like my uh comparatively smaller channel has uh it did the same thing in 2019 <clears throat> excuse me it, it, it sort of had this period of explosive growth and then stagnated and i kind of just had this belief that in 2021, um, you know, things would, would fire back up. Probably hasn't in the same way that I'd, I'd really hoped it had. Um, yeah. But it, I'm sort of caught in this period where, like, I'm, I'm definitely working as hard as I ever have and putting as much heart and soul as ever, and it's not really translating. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying not to beat myself up for it because it's like you can't, re- you can only control what you can control to use a really tired cliche, but it's, it, it's out of your control to some extent if your video pops or anything like that, um, mm. as long as you can sort of feel a sense of satisfaction with what you are doing. And I'm constantly trying to battle with myself to do that. How hard are you, on yourself are you? Uh, and do you think that serves you well? Uh, yeah, I can completely relate to controlling what you can control. I listened to the Ben Crow podcast, the Dill Buckley one, um, and him saying that resonated with me 
towards the end of last year because I was just looking at the views flop and feeling like absolute dog shit. I felt absolutely awful. Felt like I was failing. I felt like I wasn't good at what I what I do. So instead of trying to bring out five bang average videos a week, which is what I was doing, I tried to bring out one, especially during Feb and March. So I was bringing out one, but putting a lot of heart and soul into it. And I, I just remember thinking if I can, yeah, control what I can control, which is wake up early, turn the computer on, film, edit, um, put a bit more, a bit more editing into the video, then whatever happens, happens. So yeah, that's the mindset that I started to take on um yeah i I guess i am a little bit critical on myself it it comes and goes like i'm i'm pretty pretty proud that um i've sort of got a motivated attitude and i'd rather put something out than nothing so sometimes i'll put out a shitty video but i do get proud that um it's something I, i heard a great quote the other day on tiktok and it says uh, before you do something great, do something. And I think that's an unbelievable quote in terms of, you know, I'm aware that my best video might not be till my 800th video, but to get up to your 800th video, you got to make 799. So even though I can be like, oh, geez, I've just put out a week of shit videos. I'm aware that it's all a process of getting better. And um, yeah, a great another great analogy as I'll ramble on is Ed Sheeran talks about songwriting about like turning on a dirty tap and you just got to write songs every day. And for me, it's like, you got, you just got to make videos every day. So the more videos you make, you know, when you turn on a dirty tap, it's like that brown water comes out. So the, those bad videos come out and you get those bad videos out of you. But then after a little while, the water sort of clears a little bit. And maybe that's a good, good week, good couple of videos. Um, but then there'll still be a bad one every now and again as the water pushes through. But then after a while, you understand your capabilities and you sort of learn um, where to edit, where to put music in, where to cut things, how to trim it. So yeah, for me, I'm just, I can be hard on myself, but the overriding feeling is it's better to do something than to not put stuff out because I've certainly got friends who are the most talented YouTubers I know, but they don't put YouTube videos out. They'll be really stuck on that perfectionist like, geez, this video doesn't look like a Hamish and Andy type video. So they'll be uh, gun shy on putting it out. Um, And I feel like if they put out (laughs) videos consistently, they would get to that level. So... Yeah. Yeah, those are those are really good analogies. I like that. I'm a, I'm I'm sort of of the belief well, definitely of the belief that um well, I heard a good quote once that quantity is more important than quality on YouTube provided you've hit a point that the audience is saying yes to in terms of quality. Does that yeah. make sense? So, as yeah. long as you've hit that standard, then quality a uh, quantity will be rewarded. I was on I was on UCAT's live stream last night. He's uh streaming the uh the Olympics, Australia versus Egypt. Yep. And uh we're just yarning away. I was sort of preparing for this pod and I was like you cat, do you realize that you've actually had more views than me on YouTube this month? And he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so he went and checked it up and he couldn't believe it. Like he was, he was like, oh, wow. And the reason for that is, is uh, because he's uploaded so often and so consistently. And you, you can see um, as an example, I'm just using you cat as an example, but you can also say the same thing for Mitch Ryan, Cardman. These guys are having monstrous years yep. and they're just uploading so consistently and they're getting the reward for it so i think i think that's really good advice for young fellas out there because there's plenty of people um around that you know teenage mark who are who are just trying to um sort of develop their channel and um yeah i think the best piece of advice i've heard is that if you just simply upload uh, quantity where the quality is acceptable um you'll definitely be rewarded for it yeah 100 percent, and um and once again, like, you know, I think starting out is probably the hardest thing. But for me, I was so hungry to, like, I can't edit and I can't film. I have autofocus on. I don't change any sort of settings. I don't know what lighting to use. Like, sometimes you'll you'll look at my video and you'll be like, is he in some sort of medieval dungeon cave with a fire sort of lamp on the side like i, I just i just chuck my lights up try my best um but get... you're the top dog in this scene if you can't edit or produce <laughs> then the rest of us are fucked <laughs> but i've like through this whole process i've just been so determined that 
I can't do all these things. Mm. But if I keep doing it, I'll get slightly better. So that's why I do get proud that I think I've put out 500 videos or something and there's probably another 100 that are unlisted or, you know, whatever. I've, I've mm. done, you know, my 10,000 hours of work where I feel like I'm getting better. And even like in 2019, I was like, oh, great. You know, my videos are looking good. And I look back at 2019 videos now and I go, oh, geez, that's that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me do this video again. I'll, you know, absolutely edit the pants off it. So, um, yeah, I, I think your Mitchie Ryans, your card bands, your, car, uh, your UCATs, I, I think it's, yeah, really great that, they've gotten over that first hurdle of just starting and they're now sort of in just into it that you know they've rolled their sleeves up and they're now in the process of getting better and i think they're starting at 15 16 yeah 17 18 and in three or four years uh their content's going to look really really slick and really really good so yeah fair play to all those guys yeah, they're, they're absolutely killing it. In particular, Cardman, who I had on the pod um, like a month ago. I think I think he was on about 7,500 subscribers when I had him on, and he's wow. nearly at 12. So <laughs> he's, uh, he's having Caden McDonald 2019 <laughs> levels of growth. Uh, he's absolutely killing it. Uh, but it's great to see because it, it kind of just feeds into the ecosystem of for ev- everyone can sort of benefit from, from guys doing well. That's the great thing about YouTube. With yeah. you, I, do you ever reflect on the fact that, you know, being a full-time creator and YouTuber, your your kind of your sense of identity kind of lives and dies with how well you're going on YouTube, as opposed to someone who maybe works a nine to five. If they have a shit day at work, uh, for the most part, they can sort of just park it, and then you know that's that's work, and then I'll deal with that when I go to work the next day. But for you, it's all like every, the whole track of your life is sort of dependent <laughs> on your your relative success. Do you do you ever reflect on that, and, and do you think it's healthy? Uh, I do, but I think I'm probably caught up with it more than anyone else. So I'll have people come up and go, you know, sometimes I'll bump into people at the shops and they'll go, oh, hey, mate, absolutely love your goal kicking challenge two years ago. And they sort of give me a pat on the back and it's like they're still sort of a fan of something I've done two years ago. And in my head, I'm going, I've uploaded two tier makers, a couple of podcast clips, and that's it over the last two weeks. <laughs> I have done absolutely nothing. I am the worst creator ever. I'm so lazy. You know, I'll, I'll be so stuck in my head about how bad my last nine days have been. And someone will come up and be like, hey, mate, love your videos. Tw- 2019 song, classic. And I go, how can you say that? I have, I'm in horrendous form. So it's quite funny that personally I get caught up with that sort of feeling probably more than the audience and I've tried to learn from that and uh, just sort of, yeah, it's quite tough. I think I learned in 2020 that I can't um, sort of base my self-esteem off my views. Otherwise, (laughs) you know, I'll have bipolar because some weeks it's great and some weeks it's horrible. And especially when, yeah, I've recently got into the habit because of Druzy of looking at my YouTube studio I mm. never, ever used to do that because I'd put out a goal recreation maybe summer of 2017 and it would have like 20 views after the first week. And then fast forward two years and it had 200,000 views. So if I looked at my YouTube studio after I initially dropped my first goal recreation, I would have been like, this is the biggest flop ever, but it, it found its lane, it grew, and now they're some of my biggest videos. So I've always been of the belief you can't judge a video after half an hour it's been up but yeah since like sort of talking to Druzy, i'm now on it every day and i think that can be a little bit dangerous and misleading <laughs> as well because i'll be flat i'll be like oh geez this video flopped because it's mm. a, a eight of ten and then i come back to the next morning and it's a two of ten it's sort of bounced up so yeah i've sort of yeah tried to have tactics of like to distance myself from yeah my self-esteem being connected to my youtube channel but it's hard because everyone at work has good days and bad days. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's it's a process that I'm always yeah trying to learn and improve on. Yeah, it, it is hard. I one thing I've started doing this YouTube studio thing too, and specifically, I've kind of just uh, I've spoken to you off air about it, but tracking my monthly views and then getting a real sense of how well am I doing against every other month because you can kind of get stuck in the the idea the perception in, or in the narrative in your head that you're not going so well but when yeah. i 
did this spreadsheet. I literally made a spreadsheet of all my monthly views. <laughs> like I would have said, you know, 2019 was fantastic. 2020 was shit. Um, and then when I did it, I was like, actually, I really outperformed 2019 in almost every category except subscribers, right? So it's yeah. like, why am I beating myself up? Why am I making excuses? Whatever. And then 2021, again, the same thing. I'm, I'm actually probably growing even slower, but in terms of every other metric, I'm actually smashing previous years. So yeah. it's given me a, a better sense of, um, hey, uh, this isn't going as badly. I've got a better idea of where, where I'm at. Um, but equally, the other side of that is, you know, I can totally relate when you're sort of looking at your studio and maybe you've had three days off and, and I, I'm sure you're the same. Three days off is, is a lot. Uh, yeah. I'd imagine you, there's not too many periods where you take three days where you don't do anything. Um, but like, let's say something comes up and you, you, the green upward arrows all turn to green <laughs> downward arrows or, or gray little arrows basically on the studio just saying, you, you know, your numbers are dropping off and it, it can yeah. be a bit of a, a blow to the self-esteem. One other thing is like, I thought one, one thing that's funny is you mentioned when pl- people come up to you is, uh, I don't think I've told you this, but I, I do get recognized a little bit out, uh, particularly at the footy. Uh, or like, you know, when I go out to Freo on a night out and I'm yeah. usually with Druzy in the latter scenario. But the amount of people who say, hey, True Footy, um, you know, I like your videos, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, that sounded really rude. I'm very grateful for those people. But um, <laughs> but then I go, oh, do you know who this is? And n- like hardly any of the, well, probably more than half don't know who Druzy is. And I'm thinking, what what videos are you watching? Because Druzy's mm. in 80% of my videos over the last <laughs> yeah. 12 months. And don't get me wrong, I'm not ungrateful. I'm not saying, oh, you're not a real fan. I'm just saying it's interesting that people have this perception of me that they can recognize me, but probably haven't watched a video in a year. Like, how does that work? Yeah. Or, like, my background videos are doing well. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, sometimes, and I can acknowledge this, but sometimes I can be a fan of someone but then sort of dip out of their content so like i'm a massive fan of cody co but i haven't watched a video for about eight months and i they they just don't excite me anymore every now and again i'll dip into their podcast or sort of yeah watch something of theirs but i i'm not an active fan anymore but i'm still a fan so yeah i have people come up and they'll they'll be shocked that they yeah that they bumped into me and they'll come up and and get a photo but then they'll sort of say oh mate yeah 2017 that that was unbelievable and i go that's four <laughs> years ago i've sort of done some stuff since but i don't think they would realize i'd do a you know the back pocket plug a podcast i don't think they realize mm. and and yeah so sometimes like i think there is a bit of a, a life span of your subscriber and obviously there's the day ones that you know love you from day dot but i'm sort of accepting that in two year intervals people come and go um but yeah I, i've had similar yeah situations to that where someone will come up and be like oh kados nice to meet you and they simply don't know who kuko is and we sort of go how how <laughs> <Hell, laughs> and it would happen in like 2019 and i'd go what like it would just confuse the hell out of me but um no nah, it, yeah it's always funny when that sort of stuff happens yeah, for sure. And again, I want to reiterate, I didn't want to sound ungrateful. Um, you know, when people come up and say, G'day, it's, uh, it's really nice, but it's, uh, it's just mm. a, a, a evidence that people don't live and breathe YouTube like we do. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Um, which is, yeah, it's interesting. Um, bro, how was your trip to Adelaide? Yeah, it was crazy. So, um, <laughs> I, never, <laughs> I never leave Victoria ever. I went to one uh, holiday when I was younger i think it was 10 we went to queensland for a week and that's about it i've been on a, like a plane to queensland and back and then a plane from tassie back after tasmania camp and then in the five in five uh was like the third or fourth plane i'd ever been on and i went so i'd been in three planes in my life and then when i did the five uh games in five days with cooko in 2019 i was in two planes in a day and a half so i was like oh geez really get my plane numbers up yeah. um but I, I never, I never leave Victoria. I never leave Geelong. I, I just, I'm an absolute homebody. I get quite nervous when I do things like that. But um, I did the Port Adelaide versus Melbourne uh, pre-game predictions with the pair and the backyard Charizard on the pair's YouTube yep. channel, so and that, yep. the backyard Charizard hits myself and the pair up in a group inbox and goes. I've got two tickets in the Melbourne cheer squad if anyone knows anyone who wants them. Wow. And I go, 
I'll take him. And he goes, are you taking the piss? And I said, <laughs> I said, I am. I am taking the piss, but give me give me a day. Give me a day. So he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll hold on to him. So I asked uh, Connor Rogers and said, do you want to go to Adelaide to watch the D's and Port? And he goes, I'm working. I asked Mitter Bowl the same thing. He said he was working. And one of my great mates, one of my best mates who was on school holidays and had been harassing me the last week and a half to do something and is always up for something till to noon. Um, I met, I was tentative to message him because I knew he'd be in. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure how in I am, but I know once I message him, he'll be in. So I messaged him. You wouldn't want to go to Port Adelaide uh, versus Melbourne <laughs> yeah, in a day and a half. And he's like, yep, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, great to know that you're, you're leaning towards being in. Uh, we'll sleep on it. I'll get on to you tomorrow. He's like, nah, we'll, we'll book an Airbnb right now. So we did. And we drove over on the day of the match at 5.30 a.m., um, he- headed over the border. And it was unbelievable. It was so much fun. Uh, whenever I go to games at the G, I usually drive, so I don't really drink. But we had the apartment right next to Adelaide Oval, Got in, uh, had a feed. The pair came over. We had some prees. We were sinking bevs <laughs> at, um, at at the apartment with the pair and Dill. And and then we walked over and I was really nervous because everyone who messaged me goes, be careful. Really look after yourself tonight. Be careful. And on the walk over, um, Dill had my spare scarf on his shoulders and I started filming and it just wasn't on uh, around his neck anymore. And Dill's like, oh, geez, I must have dropped it. And we sort of turn around and a bloke goes, <laughs> some Port Adelaide bloke's like, oh, yeah, must be on the railing, boys, and sort of laughed at us. And we're like, oh, geez, they've clearly pinched it off our, our neck. So that made me really nervous to go into Adelaide Oval. But I got boozed up, got a bit pissed, and just had the time of my life. And after a pretty lame couple of weeks, the Ds probably showed why I think they deserve to be in the top four. And it was, yeah, one of the best nights ever. <laughs> Wait, I can't get past the fact that someone just nicked your scarf. Yeah, so... Does that happen? Is that a, is that what they meant when they warned you? Is that what, like, Port fans are like? What? Anyone I spoke to. So, anyone. Like, I'm, I'm saying 10 or 11 plus uh, character references said, really <laughs> look after yourself tonight. And even the pair was like, yeah, like, be careful. There will be, like fracas in the crowd and there were. There were fracas all around us. Wow. Um, but we were really deep in the Melbourne... Uh, cheer squad so if we had been sort of further left or further right we might have been between the Melbourne cheer squad and the Port cheer squad and sort of sitting in the middle but we were right in the thick of it so we couldn't really hear some of the stuff but I've got footage of security dragging people out and people mouthing off to us and um, yeah it was quite funny but yeah that walk to the to the ground we got onto the bridge and yeah all of a sudden I just said to Dill I'm like oh where's the scarf and we looked behind and you know if I was behind anyone and their scarf fell off you'd pick it up and give it to them like it's like oh hey mate you dropped something so it clearly didn't fall off and as we turned around to investigate a guy sort of jokingly said oh it must be on the railing of the bri- of the bridge so we're like looking over the bridge so i don't know and i looked in the bin as well so like, i i don't know where they've chucked it but they i think they chucked it off the bridge because <laughs> it just Jeez. wasn't anywhere so um yeah, it was. <laughs> it made me really nervous, but after a couple of beers and getting in the cheer squad, and everyone was just so lovely. Like the Melbourne supporters were unreal. I, I've never really sat in the cheer squad before, but it was yeah, so much fun. And then the backyard Charizard popped down at half time, so we're chatting to him. And then uh, the pair and and Dill and myself went to the casino afterwards and had one of the all time great nights. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. I, I can't believe the Eagles fans have the reputation they have when, when that shit happens. All we do is yeah. sit, and, sit in the stands, sip and Chardonnay, clapping yep. uh, Andrew <laughs> Gaff after he belts Andrew Rachel. <laughs> um, no, only joking. Um, man, my my uh, jealousy levels were peaking. I was... Because uh, I, I, I didn't know you were going. I just saw you... I think you uploaded a story. Is that pretty much how you announced you were there? You were just... You yeah. You had a photo? Yeah, that was, that was sick. Um, I... I think I might have told you this, but I, w- I was meant to be flying into Melbourne today. I never booked the flight. Um, <laughs> thankfully, like the COVID situation sort of unfolded right before I did that. But I was meant yep. to be going to Dogs and D's this Saturday yep. and then Collingwood West Coast on Sunday. But uh, that's all right. It, it'll happen, oh, it'll no. happen one day. <laughs> it will. Yeah, I can't wait. Like, yeah. I think Drewsy's popped over maybe once or I think once before and we had yep. a goal-kicking challenge. And yeah, it'll be so good when we can finally all do stuff together but um 
Yeah, like yeah, just it, it was very impromptu. The Adelaide trip took my chance. Mm. Uh, drove over and drove back the next morning. So I had um, a couple of Adelaide. Uh, content creators hitting me up going oh we should collab and i'm like mate i'm halfway home (laughs) (laughs) i'm not coming over for the weekend i'm just coming over to watch the days so yeah ah that's awesome that's awesome (laughs) um i i kind of want to skip back a little bit to 2020 because there is something that probably just sort of skipped over but um in a year where you know you maybe felt like things didn't really happen your way you did achieve something pretty cool and that was your album my footy dreams never come true (laughs) <laughs> um how was uh how was releasing that because i know that took a lot of work uh yeah it, it was it was really bizarre like i would i would do things a million times differently if i did it over but that's all the you know what the learnings are all about but um it, it came about because uh at the start end of 2018 i had back pocket plugger the song up my sleeve and it took us about nine months to get that out and during 2019 we released it but as we were releasing that i had another two songs up my sleeve and i was like oh a little ep would be funny like a you know um i sort of i can't sing and i can't play guitar like genuinely can't do either there's no (laughs) there's no disputing that but i I just have delusions of grandeur of being harry styles so i I love comedy songs i love uh, parodies um, I've fallen in and out of love with the parodies, but I do enjoy them. But I just the process of making my own music is so much fun. It's so much fun. So, uh, yeah, Back Pocket Plugger came out, and then I had already had I Don't Want to Play Ones up my sleeve and Pine Chips as Back Pocket Plugger came out, and I was hoping to get them out that seat that, that year. I thought I Don't Want to Play Ones was going to come out like a month after Back Pocket Plugger, but it didn't. So we had Pine Chips and I Don't Want to Play Ones already locked and loaded and then COVID happened so I couldn't really film anything um so uh while we could still have like visitors I went up and recorded like an extra song and then an extra song and then an extra song and then all of a sudden we had six or seven songs and I was gonna choose like four of them I was gonna um whittle it down but we thought nah let's just slap it together and put it in an album so I made cult figures that I missed really late and then a couple of other songs really late. We had eight or nine songs. And um, I think just, yeah, it was just so much fun, especially when, you know, the the filming aspect of things wasn't going my way for YouTube. And, um, yeah, a, a lot wasn't going my way, but to have, like, a body of work like that. And I think some of those songs are so, so, like, silly. But um, and I think about four or five of those songs probably deserve... A music video and i think probably the limited success of the album probably comes down to the lack of music videos i did for them but yeah no nah, so much fun really stoked with the body of work and um yeah i love clicking on the spotify and not just seeing one or two songs i like seeing like a yeah a big list of songs on there i think it's cool yeah man i, I think i think you did a great job my favorite in particular was uh pine chips uh not least because I featured in the music video, albeit briefly. Yes. briefly although my understanding is, didn't I fuck it up? Didn't I? Because you, you asked me to to sort of turn on the telly and then react. Didn't? Am I right in thinking? <laughs> did I react and then turn on the telly? Yeah. So I've got I had one job. Yeah. Uh, well, Druzy is probably the the funniest out of them all. He he pulls this like weird face while he's on the phone. It's like this cartoony sort of slapsticky <laughs> face while he's on the phone. And then I think the pair is probably the best. He like slowly turns the tv on and then there's some shock and you're sort of shocked turning the tv (laughs) on but i've sort of justified it in my head like maybe the tv was on but you're turning the volume up yeah let's go with that yeah and then the other thing i had in my head like druzy's or cookson's on the phone to someone so obviously you've got the news so maybe you're like shocked from the phone call then you're turning the tv on but i reckon that's what i was trying to achieve <laughs> that was my motivation yes, as an yes, actor um, yes but <laughs> and i think um yeah it was so funny because cookson saw the clip of the backyard charizard as the news guy oh and yeah he, he took a photo of it and put it on his story and i had like people i think like your you cats and whatnot are like where is this photo from bit of footy <laughs> we're like where why is <laughs> the backyard charizard at a news desk and then when the video came out it all sort of came together and yeah it was funny. Oh, that, that's one of my favorite music videos for sure. 
Yeah, that that was a fantastic <laughs> job. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Not just because I was in it. Um, does, <laughs> does music remain a big part of your future? Like, uh, I know it's a passion of yours. Is that on the agenda in the future years? Uh, it's just so hard. So, like, I do love it, mm. but... Um, Oh, yeah, it's just really hard to do because I've got to go to Melbourne yeah. and work with my mates um, to get some of the songs done. And I think the ones that are done by my mates are the best sounding songs. I think Pine Chips is sort of underrated. Like we made that from scratch. That's me plucking the guitar on that song. Mm. Um, Jakey Ross put in the trap style drums in the background and I think it's unbelievable the way it sounds but, yeah, to get that done, I've got to go to Melbourne 15 times to get one song done. So um, I I do love the music aspect and it's something that I will continue. I, you know, I've got songs already in the can now that I need to sort of get done. But I, I think I want to take my time with it a little bit more. I think like I spoke just before about having so many learnings about making the album. Like I think... I should have picked three or four of the best songs, had a music video for each. I don't think a parody song really has much of a lifespan if it's just a song. I think what really brings the comedy and the subtle uh, the subtle lyrics to life is probably the music video and um, putting the, the story into context. So I think, yeah, like I did with Umpire Please and, and songs in the future, I think it'll be like sort of sporadically released instead of putting them all out in one album i'll sporadically release them as singles and yeah i'm certainly keen to do that going forward for sure that's a great idea mate i'm sure we uh we all can't wait me included (laughs) um your your versatility on this platform is unparalleled um and uh that kind of leads me into the latest sort of creation of yours um a show you launched this year called the uh, back pocket plugger podcast i don't know why i got tied up saying that um <laughs> h- how did that come about so it's a football podcast you do with Connor rogers yeah so um i've always wanted to do a podcast with rog we have been trying to do a podcast together since 2017 i've got video on my hard drive of us putting together um a podcast in 2017 in 2018 we tried to do another podcast and uh, i've got footage and audio from that effort so we've tried probably five or six podcasts over the times and it was just funny i wanted to talk footy weekly um i wasn't sure whether no meat in the cleats was going to happen this year or not but i knew that cookson probably didn't want to talk straight footy for an hour weekly so um i got onto rog because every monday after the weekend me and rog would sit on the phone and just talk footy just talk footy for so long and i was like this is a no-brainer. Like, we've wanted to do a podcast for ages and we talk footy every Monday, so why don't we just put this out? So, yeah, we started, yeah, just talking footy every week um, and it's been so much fun. It's been really, really good. I, I really appreciate everyone who hops on and um, gets involved and uh, people, like, we, we, we have no idea what we're talking about. It's very, like, I don't research. I'm very ill-informed. I think that adds to the charm i hope it does otherwise it's just unprofessional <laughs> but um yeah it's meant to be very light-hearted very take the piss two blokes who don't really know anything giving uninformed opinions just having a crack and um yeah it's been going okay so i've been yeah enjoying it yeah i, I think i couldn't disagree with you more about it you know being misinformed or unprofessional i think i think it's a ripping podcast i generally watch it uh, most weeks where i get the chance um both of you guys are really good I'm, I'm, i can't believe that you don't prepare for it you said so or research rather you um you guys have a very natural chemistry where like you can sort of know when to to wrap up your point and then lead the other person in and then the next person comes in seamlessly and i'm guessing roger's done a bit of work with the radios right if i'm not mistaken yeah so we both went to the radio training institute um in melbourne that's now not a thing but i did go to radio school for six months in 2015 and i think connor went in 2017 and yeah like we've just wanted to do something since forever and it, the perfect opportunity was to talk footy every week and and yeah like we, we don't like i research in terms of watch a lot of footy shows and watch a lot of footy and you know read a lot of social media articles and just sort of what every sort of bit part footy fan does um, and then we get a little bit of a run sheet fired up 
and then yeah we just fly through and tick them all off and uh, i find yeah rog so witty and so funny at times that um yeah it's it's been so much fun just uh, chewing the fat and yeah talking shit pretty much every week yeah, it's an interesting point you make about, you know, not necessarily researching heaps. It's kind of because you do you find you kind of just like immersed in football so much that you don't find that you need to, you know, pour over articles or anything like that. Because I contrast when I started YouTube and the podcast was the main thing I was trying to do. We do it like every three weeks or so. Um, then I would try and really ultra prepare for each pod. But now now I do the Drew Footy Show. I do just the tips. Um and I generally just consume a lot of football media. I watch your podcast. I find I don't actually need to go looking for, mm. for the content. I, it just sort of comes naturally. Is that sort of where you're at as well? Yeah, for sure. I think you don't want to wing it because people... Like, you don't mm. want to, like, not see a game all weekend and then talk as if you have uh, necessarily because I think that can come across a little bit uh, not fake but I think people can pick up on it if you haven't watched sure. all weekend um, and you also don't want to get in trouble like you don't want to say something that's completely wrong uh, that could make you liable or you don't want to say anything that's naive when everyone knows you're talking shit so I think mm. that there's that danger but if I watched you know five six games over the weekend and then hopped on a phone call with you we would be able to talk about the weekend's footy for two hours. Like mm. I, I, like the headlines that I've seen, the Sunday footy shows that I watch, uh, the pre-game and post-game, you know, the Sunday Arvo games that I watch that wrap up the weekend, we could talk about the big topics for hours. And that's what um, the show pretty much is. It's just two blokes who watch a little bit of footy over the weekend just having a yarn. We're not trying to break stories necessarily. We're not trying to... Uh, give the most professional opinions but we get pulled up on it as well like the audience are very good like they will reply oh geez you've left you know darcy paris out of the you know best players of the week he did this or um geez you guys have been a little bit biased towards this so the audience is smart and the audience does know um and i I don't know i think it just it's just a very uh chilled way of consuming footy media just yeah very knockabout sort of um sort of podcast about the great sport <laughs> for sure it's uh you guys do a great job the flip side of that is do you do you find yourself sick of footy at times does it get a bit much so yeah in 2017 when i was doing youtube i'd pick and choose the games i'd vlog because i it was weird because i'd work all week and then my hobby was making videos and then i'd, I'd work all week and then my hobby was uh going to the footy and once I started filming all of that, I'm like, oh, God, I've got no hobbies. Mm. Like, I genuinely, like, oh, what do you do for fun? Oh, I make YouTube videos. No, well, what else do you do? I go to the footy, but I make that a video. Oh, what else do Fuck, you do? Fuck, man, that's, oh. that's just really hit home with me. <laughs> oh, I, I, kick, I kick the footy with my mates, but I, I film that. Oh, what else? You know, oh, I, str- I, you know, I play PlayStation, but I stream that. So it got to a point where I'm like, oh, God, what wow. am I doing? Um, mm. So... I, I did a little while ago, but after it getting completely taken away, I was so hungry to make content out of anything this year. So I a, any game I've been to, I've vlogged, and I get home and I whip it up straight away. And I know there's only a couple of weeks left of the season, and um, you know it, it was mid May, mid mid June, and I'm going, oh geez, the season's over. So, you know, we're around ten or eleven. Yeah, the season is over. My, you know, I, I just think so far forward that the season's going to go on a blink of an eye that I've tried to make the most of it. So this season I haven't at all. Like I haven't been sick of footy whatsoever. I think maybe the D's winning as well has made me just embrace the season uh, more than ever instead of just being upset and um, a little bit drained out on the Sunday night. I'm keen to watch Footy Classified tell me how good the D's are. Mm. Uh, I haven't been watching them over the last six weeks. But, uh, yeah, I, I've just been so immersed more than I ever have before. And I think probably when we made the first podcast uh, about a year ago, I was really hesitant to use the word YouTuber. I was hesitant to say AFL YouTuber. I felt like mm. that was sort of diminishing some of my skills because I feel like I can make very good YouTube content that isn't in the AFL uh, category. But sort of since then, I've just embraced it full on. I'm like, 
nah, stuff it. Let's lean into the skid. Let's double down on any sort of ability that I have in this category. Um, I love football. It's like even off camera, my my vocabulary is just football analogies, whether it's whipping up <laughs> dinner. I'll go, geez, it's on here at the G when I drop the chicken in, the oil's just pissing out anywhere. I go, oh, geez, it's on for young and old here. Like I've just, I am just so football orientated that I feel like it was a little bit silly for me to be hesitant to dive right in. So uh, no, I haven't this year, but I... I have before, like, sort of fallen out of love with footy while doing this, but this year I've just been, nah, just, yeah, so into it. I'd love to hear that as well. Um, <laughs> I think, I honestly think part of it's got to be the success of your footy team because... 100%. Yeah, because at the moment, like, I I have put out the Audit Eagles video um, because, you know, frankly, there's been things to say. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to sound like a wanker here, but when the Eagles aren't travelling so well, or even when they are... People, because I'm the footy guy, like in my outside life as well. Um, when I say that, I mean people know I do football on YouTube. They know how passionate of an Eagles fan I am. Yeah. And their way of you know trying to make conversation with me to try and connect with me in a really nice way is to yes. talk about the Eagles and footy and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And I find like especially when we're traveling poorly, I'm just like, I am sick of saying the same <laughs> lines over and over again yeah. about how average we are, or, or even when it's positive, it's just. I, I get tired of it, and I know I sound like an asshole with people just literally just trying to connect with me, um, and they're being nice. Um, but that's me just being a wanker. But no, think- it, it can be quite funny. Like uh, you'll go out and have a few beers, and your mates will go, "Geez, how about the Eagles?" And then a fan will come up and go, "Geez, how about those Eagles?" And you s- sort mm. of chat to them, and then you'll go to um, family lunch, and your uncle will go, "Oh, Jesse, how about those Eagles?" Yeah. And then like it just becomes all consuming at times and i have sometimes yeah been out at the bar and uh it happens every now and again where the conversation is mainly about yeah youtube and (laughs) mainly about footy um and sometimes i've got to sort of uh actively go hang on no this isn't all we're going to talk about and start asking them questions and asking about their life because otherwise, if I sort of go with the flow, it could be sort of a one-sided football YouTube chat. So yeah, I definitely yeah can relate to. It does get qu- quite consuming at times. Uh, the other thing for me, I'll say as well, is I kind of find it hard to um to really steer those conversations away because. I've become such a one-dimensional person, to be completely honest. Like, I, I work hard at work, and then I come home, and then I do this, and I literally live and breathe football. So, my ability to have conversations yeah. that aren't about football has also diminished, well, um, yeah. which and is it's, really it's, tough. It's so much easier as well. Like, I, I find if I'm out at a bar and someone's talking to me, I feel very comfortable answering questions and i feel a little bit out of my depth asking questions so like yeah i'll be standing there going i should ask how they've been i saw something pop up on instagram like that they did this over the weekend i should ask about that i should ask about that and then in my head i'll go nah what if it wasn't their instagram story what if you get it wrong what if you you know what if they don't like that question so sometimes i can second guess myself but answering questions you know oh yeah how's youtube oh yeah it's great like you know i can (laughs) ramble on about myself for for days so it it is quite funny where you do sort of check yourself and acknowledge how consuming it is and um yeah ways you can sort of get better at trying not to be stuck in the bubble Mm. it's crazy how much the things you're saying resonate with me right now it's (laughs) like i when i'm having a conversation with someone at a a Public setting or a family gathering, yeah. You you think okay? I, I think I saw something on social media. Did you just get engaged, or have you got a three month old? And <laughs> yeah, and does everybody know about this? Do I say congratulations? Is it weird if I say congratulations so far after the fact? Because then you're yeah. like, wait, you haven't messaged me already to say congratulations. This is just the classic sort of overthinking yeah, and, kind and of then, uh, thing. And then I'll do. go, I'll go. Nah, I won't say it. So then I'll go, oh, g'day guys. And then I'll walk away from like that conversation going. I am the rudest person. How could I not say that? Why didn't I say that? I should have said it. And then I go, well, ah, that's annoying because deep down my personality is very proper and very classy. Well, not classy, but I, I like traditional like things. I know what you mean. Yeah, like that where um, you say stuff like that. But then 
I'll be reluctant to because it's not really my personality. And then I feel rude and, yeah, it's an absolute nightmare. It's a jungle out there. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it is. It's a nightmare, mate. Yeah, it is interesting to reflect on, like, is is that just me? Is that my personality? Probably. But I think it's probably exacerbated by the fact that I live such an insular lifestyle. Like, I'm obsessed with this one thing um, and then I just kind of absorb myself in it. Um, Yeah. But you've... One thing I I kind of... not It's not advice, but, like, if I could tell you something from 2018 was the first year I did um, on YouTube and that was of course the year the Eagles won the flag and my my biggest regret is not documenting more of that season from an Eagles perspective yeah. because yeah. I could look back and have this monstrous kind of like creation where um, <laughs> you know I could see the, the journey and I could even put that into a new production new video or something mm. really cool like that imagine how cool it would be for you if you <laughs> get to do that at the end of the year <laughs> have you have you had time to reflect on that at all, or are you just still too could like um, not wanting to get your hopes up? I have, I am a manifesting, imagining, um, sort of very visual person, and yeah. I have never ever in my life pictured the days winning a flag. <clears throat> I just haven't had. Wow. I like I've I like I picture. You know, I, I sometimes, you know, I'll whip up an album and I'll picture playing it in front of people. I go, geez, imagine being on stage. I'm at Glastonbury, you know, just pumping out back pocket plugger. And then I sort of think to myself, well, that's just, impo- you know, that's that'll never happen. Why am I thinking this? And mm. I'll, I'll have other sort of, you know, video ideas. Oh, imagine kicking the footy, doing a goal you know, recreation with this, you know, d- you know, this sort of person. So I imagine everything and picture everything. And I've never, ever pictured the D's winning a flag because we've been so far away from it that it, it's too hard to imagine. Like trying to picture, it, it just it can't happen. Yeah, we're, we're 17th, we're 16th. It, I cannot picture it. It says a lot when you're picturing Glastonbury and then can't Yes, picture you yes. I'm picturing play. myself bringing out Cooko to rap about uh, football so hard. I can picture that, us on stage. I can, yeah. I can, And I can still sort of see that. I don't know how, but um, I, can, I can picture all these sort of wacky things. But I, for some reason, I've never pictured the D's winning a flag until this year. I, I have had visions, and I don't know why, but it's Alex Neil Bullen getting a premiership medal. And I don't know why it's Alex Neil Bullen, but I can I can see him walking up to the dais. And I don't know if it'll happen this year or in the next two or three, but I do sit there and think the body of work that I have is really, really cool. I've been vlogging since 2017. Um, I've been going, yeah, vlogging games. I have live stream clips uh, consistently over the last three years of me reacting to my footy club. And I've got heaps of footage of 2019 where we finished second last. And I feel like that's a great place to kick the doco off <laughs> sort of thing. So <laughs> Yeah, true, true. Um, yeah, like I'm, uh, yeah, I, I am excited. And actually in, in 2019, um we got asked if we wanted to go to the AFL Grand Final from the AFL, mm. <clears throat> uh, Cookson and I, and I declined because one, um, I'd done so much footy stuff and been so busy that week that all I wanted to do was relax and watch the Grand Final because me and my mates have this big barbecue and it's just my favourite day of the year. It's just so much fun. Um, so one, I didn't want to miss that, but two, I didn't want to go to the AFL Grand Final every year and then it lose its buzz in the next mm. 10 years when the D's make it. Like, say, you know, we do do AFL stuff every year. Um, and then the D's make it, I'll, you know, rocking up and going to the parade and walking in, I feel it would lose the buzz a bit. So I declined going to the grand final um, because of that, because I want my first AFL grand final vlog to be a D's one and I thought you know saying goodbye to that might mean I don't get to go to one for six seven years but I felt like that would make the story a little bit better and a little bit less sort of tacky than me just being able to go every year so if it happens this year it'd be amazing but I feel like if it doesn't it's okay like it's I feel like we got a couple years to really have a crack at it and um yeah, for the first time ever, I can see Alex Neil Bullen walking up and getting his medal for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I When you first started talking then, I was like, I could not relate at all. I thought, how can you turn down uh, an opportunity to go to a grand final? But it, it is true. It would be different going to a neutral one. I've never been to a neutral one. I'm lucky to have gone to three <laughs> grand finals. Um, 
But I, th- I see what you're saying about the, you want to be the first time that electric atmosphere to be the D's. And um, yeah, well, I, I yeah. still think it's going to happen. I think it would just like imagine, you know, uh, grand final vlog and then next year, grand final vlog and then next year, grand final vlog. I think the fans would be like, ah, oh, it's not that special when like the sixth grand final vlog that I do is um, the, the D's one. I think it'd be like, ah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I I don't. For some reason, in my head, I probably should have gone. To be honest, because yeah. <laughs> it would have it looked like an amazing day. But in my head, it was like when I finally get to go, and it's the D's, and it's Grand Final Day vlog, and it's got the Melbourne logo on it in the thumbnail, and it's it's the real thing. I think that will be that'll be the pinnacle. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I think you're wrong though. I think I think people would love to see a D's Grand Final vlog because they know how much you've agonized for it. Um, they w- we, would still, we would still click on that, mate. But, I, like, respect. That's, uh, that's cool that you've got that vision. Do you, do, I know you're a conservative fan by nature, um, and it's been a, you know, a pretty successful year. Um, these have just slipped down to third after losing to the Dogs. But um, as far as I'm concerned, like, I'm not getting too carried away with the, the slump. I still think their best brand of football this year has been um, the best, in my opinion. Do, do you think being in the public arena, so to speak, like obviously your your views on f- uh, football and the way you experience football is so public, do you think that makes it harder to get up and about or do you think it's just more your nature? Uh, depends. It, it depends. Like I put a little bit of mayo. Ah, oh, it's tough. Like I put mayo. Oh, I feel like I'm performing when I'm on live stream, if that makes sense. Like yeah, it, right. It, it's a performance. I've got to be entertaining. Yeah. So I put mayo on some of my reactions, but then I also would be cracking it a lot more and being a lot more salty and probably being a little bit more passionate if I wasn't on camera. So it's like this mixture of like, I am going above and beyond in the flatter moments where you'd normally be sitting on the couch and I am sort of uh, curtailing the pumped moments because I don't want to come across as an absolute loser. Uh, Yeah, I'm not sure. I just... I do <clears throat> sometimes look at the Bev show and go, ah, oh, I don't. <laughs> I, I love Bev's passion. Absolutely love Bev's passion. But sometimes I go, oh, geez, I, I don't know if I could be that sort of passionate. And then I'll mm. release a sort of Instagram clip of me reacting to some D's highlights. And I go, I am as much as a <laughs> bit of a <laughs> not all there nuffy as you know, anyone else out there. So I, I do, yeah, it, it's tough where you sort of... Um, I don't know. It, it, it is, yeah, it, it's weird. I, I I don't really have a choice, though. Like, I, I've always wanted to do media and be in the public eye, so I don't know. It, it is what it is. It comes with the good stuff and the bad stuff. Like, I feel like I'm immersed in this community of, like, Melbourne supporters that um, I'll walk to the G and I see familiar faces that hit me up on Twitter and stuff. And I'm, like, a Geordie McCleary who um, I chat to, you know, quite regularly I, I go to a game by myself and i hit him up and i'm like oh can, can i sit with you because I've, I've got no one to go to so i feel really happy that i've got like a really cool d's community but it comes with the bad side of um because everyone knows i'm a d's fan i can cop some horrendous stuff when we lose <laughs> really <laughs> like, like like not too not too bad but when we lost to adelaide oh, my dms were filled with like wow. you guys are absolutely shit house <laughs> and whatnot yeah um but i can yeah. i can relate to that a bit man they um <laughs> losing to north melbourne was tough uh in terms of the abuse i got i i'm not gonna lie like <laughs> i i mean fair play like yeah, if you lose to the bottom team after um you kind of rip on them all year um yes, i can yes. accept that but there was a few comments that stayed with me i was like fuck how many people have just been waiting for this to happen to to let me yeah. know what they think of me it's it, yeah <laughs> like every, like i think we all sort of build up a wall to that stuff but when you're least expect it sometimes they can slip through to the keeper and you're like oh that one had a bit of swing. Yeah, well, the one, yeah, the ones that zing me the most are probably, probably like middle of last year when I'm battling, uh, making bang average content but working twice as hard, and someone will write, you know, something like, "Oh, geez, he's just not into this one," or something like subtle. Right. Like it's if someone goes, "This bloke's a cockhead," I you know bounces off me. But mm. if someone goes, um, oh, "He hasn't really put much effort into you know, something like that," I go, "Oh." god they've nailed it <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's straight yeah. through the armor if you kind of almost believe an element to it then i guess it would always make it a little bit worse hey if, yeah, you, if you're not happy sure. with yourself and then they sort of pick up on that that <laughs> that insecurity there 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. How much would a Melbourne Geelong grand final mean to you? Or like how big would it be to you? Because I know that, you know, being a Geelong boy, um, you've been, a, you know, at the receiving end of a few beltings at uh, a GMHBA stadium. But um, how, how big would that be in terms of the narrative? Then it would be the biggest narrative. It would be the <laughs> biggest narrative, especially when I've got the clips of 2018 of Max Gorn missing and then Zach Tui nailing the oh, goal shit. after the siren. Yeah. And then I've got the clips of the qualifying, uh, the elimination final where we knock them off. And uh, I've got three or four vlogs of me down at GMHBA Stadium. And I, I, the narrative is massive and mm. it it would be massive. And, you know, I've got Geelong mates who have been rinsing me all year. And I don't understand it. Like, you were the most successful team of the last 15 years. How are you insecure? Like, how are you? <laughs> how are you salty? I don't really understand. Like, if uh, yeah, it just makes no sense. Like, a team su- ha- has had zero success, and you're just arrogantly putting them down for being successful this year. Uh, they're the conversations I've had this year with some Geelong people, and it sort of reinforces why I have the feelings I have towards them. But if I'm going to take my bias, sort of. Uh, annoyance for Geelong off they deserve a flag like they need this flag if they don't win this flag I can't see them winning one for 50 years because they've had the best side on paper you could ever have and then not only do they have the best side they add like Sean Higgins who was North Melbourne's best player they add Isaac Smith Mm. who's one of Hawthorne's most integral players and they add GWS's best player so they (laughs) they must win this flag I just if you can't win a flag with that side, I don't know how you're going to win one for 20 or 30 years. So I respect the hell out of them. I want my football club to be half as good as them. And I think they must just simply win this flag. They've got to win this flag. So if we come up against them and get done, I think it is what it is because they deserve they deserve another flag with what they've done over the last 10 years. Well, not the answer I was expecting, but uh, really well articulated nonetheless. Can I put you on the spot a little bit? Can I get you to put in a grand final prediction? Because uh, that's what people are here for. Um, I don't think the D's are going to make it. I don't. Really? I don't, yeah, I don't know why. I just, I, I think it'll happen soon, but I don't think it'll happen. Well, why not though? I don't really rate the Bulldogs. I <laughs> this don't must rate... be like a constant cycle in your head. It is. Well, because <laughs> I think we played some of the best footy of the year out of anyone and I uh, still I don't think we'll make it I, I geez Geelong will be in it and then it'll be out of Brisbane and the Bulldogs and I'm going to say the Lions I reckon the Lions are going to turn it on so I'm going to say Geelong and Lions and I reckon wow. Geelong will continue their choking form unfortunately even though they need they just simply got to win this flag <laughs> I think the Lions by 22 points in the granny Wow, that would be huge. That would be huge. They're sort of facing a bit of a battle for fourth spot at the moment, but they are certainly a uh, at yeah, least and they've a premiership. Just missed, they've just missed their midfielder. I think Lockie yeah. Neal's in and Hipwood's out. So what am I doing? True. Why? Yeah. Am I, <laughs> this is the year for the Ds. What am I doing? Yeah, uh, yeah no, nah, Lions for me. Lions by four, girls. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, cool, man. So we're just... Just probably coming to the end of the potty, but um, I, I want to ask, you know, when uh, when the time comes at the end of the year, when I catch the flight to Melbourne and we're at Revolver Nightclub, sick and back a couple of uh, <laughs> couple of Jack Daniels, um, when we're reflecting on this year, how would you want to describe it? How, like, what do you want out of it? Um, one of the great quotes of Conor McGregor, uh, he got done by Nate Diaz after one of the better runs in UFC history and everyone was rinsing him and then he came back and beat Nate Diaz and he just goes, surprise, surprise, the king is back. And I absolutely <laughs> love that quote and I want to work my ass off that I can sit back at Revolver, sink in some bevs and just go, <laughs> I feel like I'm back, especially on camera, but even off, like I lost... I lost <laughs> so much last year, like um, the the anxiety that I was like battling through and the work that I've had to do with that and just a whole heap of things happened middle of last year. So um, to yeah work on a lot of things, uh, off camera, on camera, especially on camera, but to work at a lot of things and look back and be proud of the body of work that I've had and be really optimistic about the next year, I think I'll just be sitting there going, yeah, no, nah, this is great. That's good, mate. I uh, I think 
as a, f- a friend and fan of your work, I look at what you're doing now and I think you're back. But I, <laughs> I respect that you, you kind of want to sort of keep the, the carrot in front of you and, and, and keep yeah. chasing and working to get to the next level. But uh, I think it's been, it's been great to see you return to the fold and uh, being as productive as ever. What's next for Caden McDonald? Um, I want to... It's a good question. Uh, and I do appreciate those words as well. Um, yeah, it means the world to me. Uh, what's next? I think... I want to make this as self-sufficient as it can be. I think the fallback of not getting gigs with the AFL or not getting any external work is just having what I've got be really, really solid from the foundations upwards. So I think living off AdSense is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, and, And that's what I've been doing. I've been living off the ad revenue. And I don't think there's... A lot of YouTubers out there that do it these days. I think mm. it's definitely merch and Patreons and that sort of deal to keep yourself afloat. Otherwise, you are just fighting for each video view. Um, so for me, it's like to really yeah stabilize what I've got in terms of uh, some yeah merch is probably the next goal. And then in saying that, I do want to get back into the media game. So I've hopefully got a couple of gigs with the AFL coming up in the near future. I want to double down on those. I want to get more of those next year. I want to take my opportunity, pitch ideas to them and just try like maybe in 18 months, try and see myself as someone who's genuinely in like the media, the footy media, not just the YouTube kid. Hopefully I can transition and yeah, but you know, just grow what I've gotten. Yeah. Yeah. Just take it to the next level, I guess. That's good to hear, mate. And uh, we've got absolute faith that you're going to achieve all of that and more. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. So taking you know a good hour with me to do my podcast, I, I really, really appreciate it, mate. Not a drama in the world, Jesse. I love what you're doing. Keep chipping away at it. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you getting me on. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, guys, if you haven't heard of Cade McDonald before... Um, you, what are you doing? Uh, he's Kate McDonald on YouTube. You're Kados38 on Instagram. Are you Kados38 on TikTok as well? I'm Kados38 everywhere. Um, yeah, right. Okay. So, yeah, lucky enough to snag that elusive username. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Now, good stuff. Go check him out if you haven't already. Um, Kaden, I look forward to our post grand final podcast talking about the D's historic win. Unbelievable. See you then. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Catch you later.